All right, welcome everyone. Today we have Tom Mitchell, who'll be speaking in the morning. Uh, Tom is the head of the machine learning department here at CMU, and he's going to be, and also actually one of the authors of one of the more prominent machine learning books. Uh, he's been doing this for a very long time. Uh, he's going to talk today about never-ending language learning. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks, guys. It's good to see you all here. Um, before I start speaking at you, I want to know who you are. So uh, let's see. How many people have had a machine learning class already? OK. How many people are undergraduate students? How many people are graduate students? How many people are not students? OK. Cool. How many people are, uh, have a degree in computer science? I have to put my hand down because I don't. OK. Uh, engineering, business, art history. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right, so um, I'll try to say something relevant, but in case you think that I'm not fitting your uh, background or your vocabulary, just shout out and we'll take it from there. Um, I'm happy to adapt. So what I want to talk about today is machine learning, obviously. But um, I want to talk about a particular research project that we've been working on now for over five years. But the idea is, uh, is the following, that if you look at the kinds of machine learning algorithms that we have today that are in widespread use for things like spam filter, training spam filters, or training credit card fraud detectors, or your favorite. What you notice is that they're mostly built on algorithms that you give them some historical data set. For example, a set of credit card transactions labeled as, oh, these ones turned out to be fraud in retrospect, and these ones turned out not to be fraud. And then you run your algorithm, and it discovers, hopefully, uh, the regularities the uh, features that characterize, that discriminate the positive from the negative examples. So you have a data set, you run this program on it, and then you get uh, maybe a decision tree or a logistic regression function or a support vector machine or whatever, uh, depending on the algorithm, but you get the result. And then you can use that learned decision procedure to classify new things. So that's uh, um, I'll call that um, uh, traditional machine learning. And if you talk to your mother and you tell your mother that you're working on learning, I've tried this experiment myself, um, she thinks of something totally different because she watched you grow up. She watched you learn. And so the number one underlying tenet of this research is that we're never really going to understand learning in machines or people until we can build machines that do these things, that like you and I learn many different things over many years and become better learners over time. So I'll call this paradigm uh, never-ending learning. I guess for us humans it ends at some point, but um, the idea is, if you think about the kind of learning that you and I do as humans, right, first we learn to crawl, then later we learn to walk, later we learn maybe to ride a bicycle. First we learn to count, then maybe later we learn arithmetic, maybe later algebra, calculus. Um, somewhere along the line we learn physics, maybe, and maybe we get, and we get synergy among all these things. Right? We, uh, for example, when you're learning physics, it helps that you already know how to ride a bike, that you have some intuition about the physical world. It helps that you're taking calculus, because that is the uh, formalism with which we can make precise statements about physics. Um, so there's this kind of, you learn many things, and you get synergy among the different things you learn. And uh, you also learn it in a particular sequence, right? First you learn to add, later you learn arithmetic, then algebra, it would be just stupid to try to start with algebra and later learn arithmetic. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So 
us people, we learn many different things in a staged sequence and in a way where we get synergy among the different things that we're learning to the point where once we learn this thing better, we actually are now able to learn this thing better. And so it's a very different but very natural view of learning. But um, so the brain teaser for this morning is simply the question, what would it take to get a computer program that exhibits that kind of learning? So that's the question for this morning that I want you to help me think through. And um, I want to describe a research project. We decided to study this problem by picking a case study, uh, which we call our never-ending language learner. And here's the problem. Here, here's the specification for the system that we want to build. Okay, uh, I'll start with the task. The task of the system is simple to state. It has to run 24 hours a day forever. That's easy. Um, and then each day it has to do just two things. It has to read more stuff from the web and extract that into structured facts. Facts like Carnegie Mellon is located in Pittsburgh. Or yogurt is a good breakfast material. Um, and number two, just as important, maybe more important, every day it also has to learn to do this better than it could yesterday. How do we know that? Well, if we send it back to the same text today that it had visited yesterday and it had learned to read better, then we would expect today it should be able to get from that same text more beliefs more accurately. Okay. So that's the task. It's easy to write down. And for inputs, we give the system these things up on top. We give it an initial ontology. By that I mean we define categories and relations that we want it to extract. So for example, we give it categories like universities, foods, sports, and we'll give it relations, pairwise relations among those categories like university located in city. And for each of those predicates, each of those categories and relations, we also give it a dozen labeled examples. So if we say we want it to learn about universities, then we give it Carnegie Mellon University, Harvard University, University of Paris South, and so forth. A dozen noun phrases, literally. And for relations, the same thing. If we wanted to learn the relation university located in city, we give it a dozen noun phrase pairs. Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, etc. So the label data is basically a dozen examples per category. Then we give it the web, that's unlabeled data. And what turns out to be about five minutes a day of interaction with humans. Although if you get interested, you could bump that up by visiting the Nell website and interacting with it yourself. Okay, so, so it's clear what the problem is, right? We're trying to get a system we, to do this starting with a small amount of label data and then a lot of unlabeled web. And so, the, so we've been working on this for a while and Nell today uh, has been running since 2010. So it's four years old. And um, if you look at Nell today, which you can, we'll browse it in a second. Uh, it currently has a knowledge base, a collection of beliefs with over 70 million candidate beliefs, like Carnegie Mellon is located in Pittsburgh. I don't know what it believes about yogurt. Um, it is learning to read better. It's a better reader today than it was last month, and it was better then than it was last year. So it is getting better. Uh, it's also not only learning to read, but it's also learning to reason, to do inference over these 70 million beliefs to infer additional beliefs that it hasn't read yet. And it's now learning to extend that initial manual, manually provided collection of categories and relations that we gave it. So what I want to do this morning is go through the system, talk about the algorithms that are in there, uh, show you the ways in which um, we're pleased with the system 
and ways in which we're uh, not pleased with the system and some of the open research issues around this. But before we get into uh, that, let's just kind of take a look at the knowledge base. So when I say that it has 70 million candidate beliefs, um, here are some of them. And I have to tell you, when I put together this slide, I left out incorrect beliefs. It has lots of incorrect beliefs also. But I decided to include only correct ones uh, in this slide. But each of these red arrows you can think of as a belief triple. So for example, uh, Nell believes that Toronto has a city paper called Globe and Mail, and that Milton is a writer for that paper. Toronto's the hometown of the Maple Leafs, who won the Stanley Cup, also won by the Red Wings, whose hometown is Detroit, etc. Okay, so each of those triples is a belief. And although it's not shown here, um, each of those red arrows has a confidence a score between 0 and 1 that indicates how strongly Nell believes that. And these are all things that Nell has read and therefore believes over the, over the last four years. Okay, now we can also um, browse Nell on the web. Uh, part of the deal with this project is that we decided we should keep the knowledge base um, always available, publicly downloadable uh, for the entire life of the project, which of course is forever. Um, and so you can visit the NEL website and browse the knowledge base, download the knowledge base if you like, uh, use it in any way you like. But um, let's just, before we talk about the algorithms, let's browse the knowledge base. Now, I think it should be clear that one of the learning problems Nell works on is figuring out what noun phrases mean. In fact, one of the first two learning tasks that Nell worked on is now working on lots of them. But one of the first two was just to find every noun phrase it could on the web. It's working with over 100 million noun phrases. And for each of those, to try to classify that noun phrase which of these hundreds of categories that are in its ontology does that noun phrase refer to? So let's take a look this, this time at the noun phrase diabetes. What does Nell believe about the noun phrase diabetes? Well, it believes several things. It believes, for example, it belongs to categories including physiological condition. So things that the noun phrase diabetes refers to a physiological condition. It thinks it refers to a disease? Is this font big enough for you guys to see? Okay, good. I saw a nod toward the back. That's good. Um, it believes it's a disease and several other things. But here you can also see something about why Nell believes diabetes is a disease. Um, let's look here. One reason Nell believes that diabetes is a disease is that it found it in this context. It found it surrounded by the words sicknesses, comma, such as diabetes. But it also found it um, next to the phrase risk of adult onset diabetes um, or treatment of pancreatic diabetes or medical ailments like diabetes, etc. So each one of these phrases is a phrase that on the web somewhere Nell found surrounding the noun phrase diabetes. And each of those it takes as some probabilistic evidence that this noun phrase diabetes probably refers to a disease. And taken together, that's an overwhelming amount of probabilistic evidence that makes Nell highly confident that diabetes is probably a noun phrase that refers to a disease. Okay, so one thing you can see here is that the way Nell reads is kind of inhuman, right? If us humans, we read by taking a document and taking a sentence and really understanding that sentence in detail. But here, at least this type of reading, Nell is uh, not doing that really. It's doing a shallow analysis of many, many different mentions 
of the noun phrase diabetes found across roughly a billion web pages. So um, that's one thing to notice. Here's another thing. There's another reason, different reason, Nell believes diabetes could be a disease. Um, and that's because it ends with E-T-E-S. I don't know how many diseases there are that end with E-T-E-S. But um, for its own reasons, Nell believes that if a noun phrase ends with E-T-E-S, it's more probable, it has some weight there associated with that feature. Um, and so this way of reading is to use the context around a noun phrase. But this other way of reading, CMC, a different reader in Nell, is actually looking at the orthographic, uh, the character substrings in the noun phrase and ignoring the context. And so here you can see that Nell actually reads with multiple strategies, and it integrates the probabilistic evidence that it gets from these multiple strategies as it's reading, so that in the end it's way confident, I would say overconfident, that uh, diabetes is probably a disease. Okay? So let's look at what else Nell believes about this noun phrase. You can see it has a lot of evidence about being a disease. It also believes that diabetes exists at certain dates. This is kind of unfortunate. Uh, you and I know diabetes is not a kind of temporal, it's not something that only occurs in certain years, but Nell doesn't know that. And one of the relations it tries to read is what years or dates things are in. And it did find phrases like diabetes in February 2003, somewhere on the web. And so, it believes that diabetes exists at least during 2003. So that's kind of odd. What else? It believes that certain types of animals can develop diabetes. Cats, dogs, rats, mice, children. And, uh, <laughs> and again, it has evidence. If you want to know why it thinks mice can develop, because it's, it found the phrase mice who have type D means any integer, diabetes, or diabetes in non-obese diabetic mice, or uh, mice bred to develop diabetes, and so forth. So those are its phrases. Oh, by the way, you might be asking, where, where do all these phrases come from? That's what it's been learning for the last four years. Are these different, all these phrases, all of these different character string strategies, and more. So that at this point, Nell has roughly a million, well, millions of learned phrases and substring parameters and other types of parameters that it has learned for doing these extractions. Um, okay, what else? Kids can develop, men can develop diabetes, individuals, families, teens. Um, diabetes, uh, inverse of emotion associated with disease. Uh, the disease can uh, give you emotions like distress and numbness, no please. Um, food, foods can cause diabetes, like sugar can cause diabetes, according to Nell. So can carbohydrates, carbs, glucose, junk food, sugars, hypertension. Hypertension, by the way, is not a food, so here's an error in Nell's belief system. It thinks the hypertension is a food that can cause diabetes. Uh, weight loss, similarly, category error. It believes there are foods that decrease the risk of diabetes. Vegetables, coffee, grains, whole grains. It believes uh, diabetes is a physiological condition possibly treated by Avandia and actose and glufage and, and so forth. It can be a side effect of other drugs. And of course, each of these things is another noun phrase, like Gavandia is just another noun phrase uh, about which Nell holds beliefs. It believes, in this case, that it's a drug and it has reasons. It believes it's a product. It believes that it has side effects like heart attacks, heart failure, um, congestive heart fail, heart disease, that it possibly treats diabetes, 
that is produced by GlaxoSmithKline, etc. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, this knowledge base is basically built up by now looking at every noun phrase that it could find, trying to categorize it, trying to find relations in which it participates, trying to assemble probabilistic evidence from many, many different locations on the web, leveraging the redundancy, the tremendous redundancy of information that's on the web. There are literally thousands, many thousands of uh, mentions of diabetes on the web. And together, they paint a fairly uh, intricate picture of the meaning of that. OK, so I'm going to stop browsing here. Any questions before I stop browsing? OK, this, sure. Um, these are in this case, so um, as I mentioned, we started out by giving the system categories and relations by hand, but uh, more recently, Nell has uh, been adding its own to that. And so when you saw those weird looking names like inverse of food can treat, those are, those are names of relations that Nell made up. Um, that are, correspond to relations that it invented to, because it noticed that there was some statistically interesting relationship between the category food and the category disease and certain kind. Well, we'll talk about the algorithm by which it did that. But um, what we're looking at here is a mix of some manually provided categories, like disease we provided, and then uh, quite a few of these relations, in fact, are now invented relations. Uh -huh. So that particular relation, the inverse of something, the something was provided by you? No, no, no. Okay. Nell makes up, when Nell makes up a relation like food can prevent disease, then it also names the inverse of it. It makes up both the relation and the inverse of the relation. So, um, so in any, any time you run across a relation that starts with inverse of, it's part of one, one of the relations Nell made up. OK, so you get the idea. And you're welcome to browse the Nell knowledge base, download the knowledge base if you like, read all the papers that are on the website if you like, etc. All right, so now the interesting question, of course, is, well, what's inside there? Um, how does Nell work? And the truth of the matter is that Nell is kind of a big system at this point. But the good news for this morning is that there are basically four good ideas in Nell. And so I can tell you what those four ideas are. And then we can also talk about uh, some of the ongoing research. But the, the key thing, if you get anything out of this talk, I want to try to um, get you to agree with me on uh, what are, I think, the four good ideas in now. OK, so the first one is around the most obvious question, which is, given that Nell has mostly unlabeled data, the web, and a little bit of labeled data, those dozen examples that we gave it for each predicate, right? when we say we want Nell to learn about disease, we give it a dozen diseases, tonsillitis, cancer, upset stomach, whatever. Um, and uh, only a dozen examples. And then we give it the web. So the very first question is, what kind of machine learning algorithm would you come up with to handle that semi-supervised learning problem? By semi-supervised, I simply mean there's a little bit of supervised labeled data, those dozen labeled examples. And then there's a lot of unsupervised, unlabeled data, all the noun phrases you can find on the web. And so the first question is, what kind of semi-supervised learning algorithm would you come up with for learning uh, to classify noun phrases into categories? So let's take, an, let's take a look at that. Suppose I give you a new category. I'll call it uh, category 753, not to bias you. And here are four positive examples. Paris, Pittsburgh, Seattle, Montpelier. Okay, so now um, 
I want you to give me an algorithm that will learn more members of this category. And so one thing you might think of, this is actually what we tried at first, um, was, well, we'll take these labeled examples of the category. We'll search on the web for phrases that occur around that, like we might find mayor of Paris and live in Montpellier. And uh, once we find those context phrases, we'll just look on the web again for more noun phrases that also occur with those. And we'll find things like mayor of San Francisco, live in denial. Um, and you do, and Nell did. Um, but you know, mostly you find cities. And so then now we can take these seven noun phrases and go search for even more contexts. And we might find, you know, San Francisco is home of and traits such as denial. And then we can iterate this process for a long time. And it's kind of a good idea, but you can see the kind of problems that it can lead to, right? It's a good idea for the first few iterations. And after that, if you let this algorithm run for four years, you won't be happy um, because the category just kind of uh, smears out into everything. So um, still, there's kind of a good idea here. And so you might think, well, I bet I could come up with a better algorithm. But I bet you can't unless you change the problem definition. I would claim that the problem here is not with the algorithm, but that we've made a fundamentally under-constrained problem. You don't know what category I actually had in mind, except that I wrote the word cities up there before. Um, if I hadn't written the word cities up there, then I could defend this by saying, well, the category I had in mind could have been uh, northern hemisphere cities. Or it could have been the union of northern hemisphere cities with personality traits. And in any of those cases, I could have given these as four labeled examples of the, any of those categories I had in mind. And so really, it's hard to complain about this algorithm, given that um, it might not have been cities that, that was the category I even had in mind. And so in this sense, the problem is really fundamentally under constrained. There's no, there's no real deep sense in which the program is wrong here. It did come up with a set of noun phrases that includes the positive examples I gave it. And there was no other information that necessarily should exclude any of those others. Okay, so this leads to good idea one in Nell. Good idea one in Nell is if you want to do semi-supervised learning of categories at this scale, do not even try to come up with an algorithm for this problem because it's a fundamentally under-constrained problem definition. Instead, this is good idea number one in now, avoid the temptation to write an algorithm that learns a single function at a time. Say a function from noun phrases to yes or no is that of referring to a person or to a city. That's too hard, that's under constraint. Much better and much easier as a learning problem is to write a program that has to learn many of these different black arrow functions simultaneously in a jointly constrained way. And I want to drill down on that and see exactly what that means. Um, and um, so, so let's do it this way. Suppose um, <coughs> I'm interested in learning this function f1 represented by this black arrow that'll take as input noun phrases represented by the context around them. Uh, so there will be a feature vector for any noun phrase telling how frequently it occurs with each of these contexts. And um, it's going to predict just a Boolean yes or no, uh, is this a person or not? Okay, uh, what algorithm would you like to, uh, you must have talked about some algorithms already. I don't know, logistic regression. 
Do we talk about logistic regression? Support vector machines? Okay, whatever. You could use whatever algorithm you want. Um, let's just say we're going to learn a linear classifier that's going to learn how to weight these different uh, features to make the prediction of whether or not it's a person. Then, in typical supervised machine learning, what we'll do is we'll try to learn those weights, those uh, parameters that, the, that we estimate from labeled data. We'll try to learn those in a way that minimizes this objective function. Right? We want to pick the weights, oops, we want to pick the weights for these different features in a way that if we sum over all the labeled examples we have, each labeled example being some noun phrase and the correct label, yes or no, is it a person, then we want to minimize the number of times that our function f1, when we apply it to a noun phrase, gives a different answer from the correct label, person. Okay, just standard supervised learning. But now, here's the key. Suppose that instead of learning one function, we actually are learning two. Remember we saw when we browsed diabetes that uh, there were letter strings as a, a second way of uh, trying to do reading. So suppose I try to learn a second function, I'll call it F2, the blue one, that has a different uh, feature vector drives a noun phrase. But it also, uh, given the same noun phrase, in fact, same noun phrases, has to predict whether something's a person. Now here's the beauty of it, and this is the key idea number one. Now think about what's the objective that we want to optimize when we train both of these functions. Maybe we'll learn weights for these features for the red function to make its decision. Separately, we'll learn a different set of weights for these features for the blue function to make its prediction. And here's the objective now that we can use. Just like before, we want to minimize the number of times on the labeled examples that function one disagrees with the true label. And we want to minimize the same thing for function two, the number of times on the labeled data that it disagrees with the correct label. But now here's the key. We can also now use the unlabeled examples. Because we also know that if F1 and F2 are correct, they should agree. Given any noun phrase, they should agree if they're correct. And so we can add a third term to our objective, which is when we're training and choosing these weights for the red and the blue functions, we want to choose them in such a way that we minimize the number of disagreements over all of the unlabeled examples that we can find. And now, now you can see why this is so important. How many labeled examples do we have? About a dozen. How many unlabeled examples do we have? About 100 million noun phrases. So this term completely dominates, not completely, almost completely, dominates what goes on with the objective. And then you can choose your favorite learning algorithm, but the idea is come up with a learning algorithm that minimizes this objective that takes into account performance on the label data, but also, very importantly, tries to minimize the number of times the two functions disagree on the unlabeled. Does that make sense? Yeah? Good. So if you didn't hear it, the question was, can't these functions agree all the time if they just always say yes? Um, they could. But there's a slightly better function um, that will use the labeled data, um, assuming my labeled data includes negative examples. Then there will be a slightly better function that doesn't say yes all the time because it has to say no for the negative labeled examples. And so um, what you say is true, that there could be something that gets all the labeled examples right and then just says uniformly yes on everything. Also another one that says uniformly no on everything else and everything in between, as long as they agree. But in fact, if you 
now comes out to a kind of relative complexity problem. Um, the number of parameters that we're estimating here is, in the end, much smaller than the number of con uh, unlabeled examples that we're trying to fit. And so uh, there's a sense in which we don't have enough parameters to define arbitrary uh, functions over this number of unlabeled examples. But your, but your, your question is, is a very good one, and it's right at the heart of things. Yes? How do you limit the number of parents? Oh, we just, uh, we just use one. In this case, say we're doing a linear classifier, then however many of these contexts we have, that's the number of linear weights that we have. Oh yeah, well we tend to use millions of contexts and roughly millions of these. So we don't, uh, different algorithms can um, do this different ways, but in now we tend to have millions of these. Um, and often it's better to use a subset than to use them all. And uh, usually some kind of cross validation scheme where you try out different numbers of features and find on a held out set of data which one works best is a reasonable strategy. And, and we do that too, that's just kind of orthogonal to the point, I'm, so I didn't get into it here. Yes? Do I want to reweight this? Yeah, very good point. So I could also, you're right, if, if I really do it literally this way, and there are 100 million terms here and 12 there and 12 there, this will totally dominate. Another thing I could do is make it, I could normalize this by the number of unlabeled examples and normalize this one by the number of labeled examples. Now I have basically the error per example instead of the sum over examples. And then that would put all three of these terms on equal footing. And um, we sometimes do that. So uh, otherwise, the more, if you have enough unlabeled data, nothing else matters. OK, but you get the idea. The idea is by learning these two functions together, we suddenly get this very valuable constraint. Now you can run with that idea. Let me come back. You, can, you don't have to stop with two. And in Nell, we don't. So there's a third type of green function that now learns, which, uh, where the features are literally HTML patterns on individual web pages. Um, and this is the work of uh, Richard Wang, one of our former PhD students working with William Cohen. Uh, and here the features are things like go to celebrities.com web page and look for a noun phrase that's surrounded by this HTML code and that'll be a feature in the same sense that these red and blue things are features. The point is that there's information in each of these red, blue, and green features and they tend to be uncorrelated information. So the more of these we can add, the better. In fact, with, a, with appropriate assumptions, you can prove theoretically that as the number of distinct functions grows, uh, you get an exponential improvement in the sample complexity, uh, effectively how well you learn, given a fixed number of training examples. Okay, but now that you've got this idea, you don't have to stop there either. In Nell, we have these different views and some others, which you'll see, um, all of which are used for predicting that something is a person. Um, for example, we saw these kinds of phrases for diabetes. Here are some for deciding that something belongs to the category mountain. And again, they look reasonable. Here are some of the ones that um, are now learned for different categories um, that have to do with the substring features. For example, the top three there are for mountain the first one says that if the last word in a noun phrase is peak, like Pike's peak, then there's a high positive weight that this probably is a mountain. On the other hand, the second one says 
If the last word is mountain, like blue mountain, it's also it's a positive weight. The third one says that if the first word is mountain, it's a negative weight, like mountain bike or mountain goat. Those are not mountains. So these are the kinds of things that get learned. And then here are some of the ones for the URL specific code. For example, this first one says, or maybe this last one is easiest. If you want to find a book and its author, you can go to lifebehindthecurve.com and find a phrase where X and Y are the book and the author, respectively, if you find this kind of uh, HTML pattern. OK, so taken together, those give now these red, blue, green functions. But now remember, Nell is also learning many categories and many relations. So for each category, not just for person, we can have Nell learn a function from any of these three views to the label, not just for person, but also for athlete, for sport, for team, for coach, for everything. And we tell Nell, when we define those categories, when we define the ontology, we do it in a hierarchy where we say, well, then athlete is a subset of person. The green lines there stand for uh, subset lines, where if, if the function that's trying to predict whether something is an athlete says yes, then the one that's trying to predict whether it's a person must also say yes. And now, just as we could previously add an objective function term forcing the two the functions based on two views to agree, we can now add another objective um, with a different notion of disagreement, but insisting that the athlete functions and the person classifiers, the athlete classifiers and the person classifiers, be consistent in the following way. So that if the person classifier says yes, the phrase is a person, and the athlete says no or yes, that's OK. But if athlete says yes and person says no, that's not OK. That's a disagreement. So we can generalize the notion of disagreement to constraint violation. And we have two kinds of constraints in Nell, subset, superset, and mutual exclusion. If you're an athlete, you're not a sport. Baseball is not an athlete. So now we have multiple functions, many black arrow functions, based on different views and different labels. And it doesn't end there. We also have relations, which are classifiers learned by classifying pairs of noun phrases. So for example, um, play sport, the relation at the top here, is a relation, be a typed relation between an athlete and a sport. And so in Nell, we insist that if play sport takes two noun phrases and says, yes, they satisfy the relation A play sport S, then it must also be the case that the noun phrase classifier for the first argument agrees that this is an athlete, and the one for the second must agree that it's a sport. So when you put this all together, you get a very intricate nest of these many, many black arrow Boolean classification functions, in fact, over 2,500 of these in now, that all get trained on la unlabeled data, but with this nest of interconstrained consistency constraints. And this makes a wildly better constrained problem that does, um, that makes that simple idea we saw before of iteratively looking for context and then um, getting more noun phrases and more context and more noun phrases. Um, this is a generalization of that idea to learning many functions that gives us a much more constrained problem. <coughs> OK, so that's key idea number one. Uh, questions? Yes. <laughs>
I agree with this comment. So uh, because we're being recorded, I'll repeat the comment, which is that there could be a case where, for example, uh, the contexts give you a very good idea that this is a city you see, mayor of um, Sharon. Sharon is a city in Pennsylvania. So is Mars, mayor of Mars. But you don't see from the character string anything that indicates it's a city. So it um, might be unwise to force these two functions to agree if one of them has no information. And I agree with that comment. And I think we could do even better than we do with the current system if we had an algorithm that somehow um, tried to estimate for each noun phrase a latent variable that indi an indicator of whether this is one of those noun phrases where this function should just abstain or not. And there, there are different variants on this kind of co-training or multitask learning uh, strategies, some of which allow functions to abstain, some of which don't. But I consider that kind of still an open research problem. And I think you're bringing up an important point. Yes? So initially, we've given manually a couple hundred categories and a couple hundred relations. And Nell has now a little over 1,000 uh, because it's contributed rough. It's contributed to it itself. So uh, we started it off manually, and now it's trying to grow. OK, so that's good idea number one in Nell. And it leads to a very simple architecture, which looks like this. This is the software, the original software architecture for now. There's a knowledge base. That's the thing we browsed. And it contains a collection of beliefs. And Nell is in an infinite loop. Each time through the loop, here's what happens. The different readers, like the one that uses those context patterns or the one that uses the morphology of the noun phrase, the letter string, or the one that uses the HTML uh, indicators, they all get to retrain themselves using the knowledge base as the probabilistically self-labeled data. They retrain themselves. And then they do whatever they like, look at more noun phrases, look at more noun phrase pairs. And they propose candidate new beliefs to the knowledge base, as well as um, they can also downweight earlier suggested beliefs. And then there's a evidence integrator that looks at all these proposals and decides what the final belief level will be. So it's a very simple algorithm. If you know an algorithm called expectation maximization, or EM, this is uh, very much an EM style algorithm where uh, on the E step, the knowledge base gets re-estimated, thus those million, tens of millions of beliefs and their confidences get re-estimated, and then on the M step, all of these learning methods and all of their parameters get re-estimated to maximize their fit with the knowledge base. And then we just iterate. And currently, Nell is on something like iteration 800 or so. A Nell iteration is about a day and a half, um, day and a half to two days right now. OK? And now, what's cool about this architecture, of course, is that if you have an idea for another learning algorithm, yours goes here. And it can contribute in parallel, just as human advice does. It can contribute in parallel with these other systems. OK, so now we can go through the other ideas a little more quickly. Um, good idea number two comes from this question. So if good idea number one was to make semi-supervised learning work, we should really couple the training of thousands of different functions. Then that leads to the question of how can we get new coupling constraints? And good idea number two in Nell is you discover them. You learn them. So for example, now that Nell has tens of millions of 
probabilistically held beliefs, it can data mine those to look for empirical regularities that hold. Empirical regularities like this one. This one says this is a horn clause, probabilistic horn clause. In English, what this says, you should believe with probability 0.93 that athlete X plays sport Y if you already believe that athlete X plays for some team Z and team Z plays sport Y. Okay, so that's common sense for you and I. But for now, this is just a discovered empirical regularity that happens to hold with probability 0.93 among many, many thousands of different athletes, teams, and sports that it has read about. It's just something that happens to be true of the knowledge base. And so by learning these, Nell can now infer new beliefs, right? If it has read that, let's say, um, Mario Lemieux plays for the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the Pittsburgh Penguins play hockey, then it can infer that Mario Lemieux plays hockey, even if it hasn't read that directly. But it also gets to use um, these rules uh, as additional coupling constraints for the training its reading system as well. And the algorithm that we used for this, I'm not going to talk too much about it because we've more recently replaced this by, by a better algorithm that I will talk about. Um, but originally we used uh, an algorithm based on some work by Ross Quinlan called a FOIL al algorithm. And so if you look at some of the rules that Nell has learned, here's a sample. Like the top one says, if an athlete plays in the league NBA, then probably they play the sport of basketball. Um, if they won the Stanley, if the team won the Stanley Cup, they probably play in the NHL and so forth. Okay, but now how does this, I start with the question, how can we learn more coupling constraints? Well, if you think about it, each of these rules is in fact a coupling constraint. Another one, before we had these green ones that correspond to subset constraints, athlete must be a subset of person. So if we claim that something is an athlete, then this other function must also claim it's a person. Then that, that rule tells us something about the consistency in labels assigned to those three relation predicates. And so it's actually a consistency constraint between play sport, place for team, and team play sport. Right? And just like we couldn't say, yes, it's an athlete, no, it's not a person, that doesn't, that's inconsistent. Similarly, here we cannot say that X plays for team Z and team Z plays sport Y, and no, uh, X does not play sport Y. We can't say that. That's inconsistent in exactly the same way. So now we have this wonderful virtuous cycle. We have these reading functions that are being learned. Those are the ones that classify noun phrases and noun phrase pairs into categories and relations. But then separately, at a whole different level, we're data mining that collection of beliefs to learn these kind of rules. They have nothing to do with reading, really. But once they're learned, we can use those to further to add more coupling constraints for, in the future, learning even better versions of these black arrow reading functions. So remember where we started with your mother, looking at, learning many things over, a sequen over time, and learning in a way where you were learning many different functions and somehow when you learned one better, it helped you get better at the other. Here we have one instance of that in Nell, where we have these reading functions that go from text to beliefs. But then we have these non-reading functions, the inference rules that are learned, that go from beliefs to new beliefs. And by learn putting together an architect, architecting a system that has both of these types of learning going on, we get this nice synergy that the better you can read, the more accurate your beliefs, the better the data mined inference rules will be, the better the inference rules are, the better the coupling constraints that let you learn to read better. 
And I think part of the, what we need to do, what we need as a field to understand is how to build software architectures around learning systems that have that kind of synergistic, learn multiple things character where the better you can learn one type of knowledge, the more it helps you constrain the learning of another type. And if we can figure out how to do that, then I think we actually will be able to make good progress on systems that learn over many years and decades and get better. So I'm very happy with this particular instance of that kind of synergy in Nell. But I have a feeling that we're just beginning to understand how to set up that kind of uh, architecture. So I think there's a lot more to be understood there. Okay, so let's, um, let me skip over some of this and maybe come back to it. I want to get to the other good ideas. Key idea number three. We'll come back and take a look at that other stuff in a minute. I want to get through the four good ideas and then have some discussion and then talk about some more advanced things. So the third good idea is one we've mentioned, is which is that if you want a never-ending learning system, you don't want it to be working on just a fixed set of learning tasks that you gave it initially. When we define that manual ontology, we're basically saying here are the things we want you to read and you don't have to read anything else. But actually there are a lot of other categories and relations that might be interesting things people are talking about on the web. And so key idea number three in Nell is that it's now beginning to have the ability to extend the ontology, make up its own categories and relations. So let's look at how that works. <coughs> and in fact, we have a couple different algorithms for this. Um, the first one is due to Tahir Mohammed, one of our former students, and uh, Stefan Hrushka, a professor uh, in Brazil who is here as a visiting professor at the time. And what Estefan and Tahir did was they came up with this very beautifully simple algorithm. Um, they said, well, now that Nell has millions of beliefs, let's look for, let's write an algorithm that looks for interesting relations to add to the ontology, which does the following thing. It'll go through every pair of categories that are currently in the ontology. For example, let's take a person as a category and musical instrument as a category. This will do that for every pair, but let's just consider a person and musical instrument as C1 and C2. And what it'll do is it'll, now that Nell has tens of thousands of noun phrases it believes refer to people and hundreds of noun phrases it believes refer to musical instruments, It'll look for pairs of those that co-occur way too frequently together to be coincidence. Like Eric Clapton and guitar occur together way too frequently to be coincidence. So does George Harrison and sitar. And furthermore, not only do these pairs stick out like a sore thumb statistically, but so do the context the text that links the two words when you find them jointly mentioned. And so what they did was they built um, uh, an algorithm that both finds these pairs, clusters the pairs that occur frequently and the context of text between them. And when you do that, you get, for musical instrument and musician categories, you get, as I mentioned, Sitar and George Harrison tenor sax and Stan Getz, et cetera. But then here are the context, the text that occurs between them. So for those when pairs, you get things like argument one, master, argument two. Like sitar master, George Harrison, or George Harrison plays sitar. So you see what's happening is they're, they're finding these uh, frequent anomalous, anomalously frequent pairs, and the context that occur as indicators of those pairs. 
And then, in fact, their algorithm suggests a name for the relation. How? By looking at this cluster of contexts and just picking the context that's closest to the centroid of the cluster, which in this case happens to be master. So Nell will name this, or suggest the name, musical instrument, musical instrument master musician as the name of a new relation. And it will propose that these are seed examples that it should use to train uh, its own readers for this relation. And that these should be the initial extraction patterns it uses. Okay, similarly, when it looks at the category cell type and chemical, it gets cell type that release chemical, like epithelial cells release surfactant. Or for river and city, it gets river in the heart of city, like Seine in the heart of Paris, or Nile in the heart of Cairo. So to me, what's cool about this is a wonderfully simple algorithm. And when we started this project, we thought ontology extension is a really, really hard problem. And it was if you, don't, if you have a system that doesn't know anything. But now that Nell has tens of millions of beliefs, it turns out using those and clustering those leads to a fairly interesting and useful way of proposing new relations. It's not as hard as it looked. And so this is another example. Remember, what we're trying to do is get a system that learns first to crawl and then to walk and then. So ontology extension is one of those things that in retrospect really was hard if you don't have, if you haven't yet learned a belief system. But once you have one, then you can look for these anomalies and do the clustering. And it's not so impenetrable a problem after all. So this is another example of where um, as you start learning and building up knowledge, you can then use that as a scaffolding to make problems that seem to be invincible before into problems that you can make progress on. So if you look at, if you, sample, if you browse the knowledge base yourself, you'll see a number of these relations in the knowledge base. These are all, uh, this is just a sample of some of the relations Nell has uh, invented. And we currently human vet these proposed relations. We don't let Nell just add them automatically. We let it propose them and we veto the ones that don't make sense. And you do get ones that don't make sense. For example, Nell thought, Nell proposed animal in city as a relation because it found that the tigers were in Detroit and the rams were in LA. And uh, there are a lot of the uh, pairs that have found. And so it proposed the animal in city. And we nixed that immediately. But so, so it still does take some human supervision. But, but nevertheless, the system is proposing a variety of uh, interesting relations. In fact, you can now go to the knowledge base and get fashion advice from now here. OK, so that's one algorithm which <coughs> Nell can use to add relations. Um, actually, Stefan is, uh, we're just about to incorporate a, a, a newer version of this algorithm that Stefan is, uh, has finished up and we're incorporating into the system. But uh, it's still based on this general idea. Uh, but there's a second type of ontology extension. That covers relations. What about categories? Well, categories, again, you could kind of cluster them. You could say, take all the animals and try to cluster them based on, say, um, their feature vectors that you use to read them, like the context, and look for clusters. Maybe the context around birds are a little different from those around fish and things like that. And we've tried that, and that seems to work. We're, we haven't incorporated it into the ongoing run of Nell, but clustering works. But um, a second way that Nell can and does uh, try to find subcategories is by reading them. 
So it turns out the wonderful thing about language is people talk about um, subcategories, and sometimes you can just read them. So Burr Settles, who is a postdoc working on the project, um, basically he said, why don't we subcategories by adding one more relation to the ontology, the subset relation. And we'll just tell Nell to learn to read subset. We'll give it some examples. In fact, what we found when we tried it was that Nell didn't learn all that accurately the subset relation unless we constrained it to uh, particular categories. So then we went ahead and we just said, let's learn uh, animal is the subset of animal. So the subset relation just over animals. This was, this gave Nell an easier problem because there's less diversity of expression if you're talking about animal subsets. And separately we'll do like uh, chemicals, our subset of chemicals. So we did that. And if you browse the knowledge base, you'll find these kind of things. So, for example, for animals that are subsets of animals, here are the kinds of um, reading context that Nell discovered. And the red categories in there are subcategories that Nell discovered by reading with these patterns. So for example, it used to have animal as a leaf node in the ontology, but it read that animals divide into pets and predators and other things. But for example, um, this pattern would fit by saying animals and other medium-sized, or sorry, pets and other medium-sized animals, or maybe it's hamsters and other medium-sized pets. You get a match on perhaps both of those. Or, right, arg1 and other biting arg2, arg1 and other ice age arg2, and so forth. So here's a case where Nell could learn to directly read uh, that the subset relation occurs. And that allowed it, allows it to discover that pets and predators are subsets of animals which have certain members. And similarly for chemicals, uh, we get things like fossil fuels and gases like uh, carbon and other natural gas and other hydrocarbon fossil fuels, for example. It's kind of interesting to see the type of text that shows up in those, because it's um, very stylized. It kind of also makes you, almost makes you think that you should be able to come up with a better learning algorithm that just generates automatically lots of these kind of pairs by looking more, um, in a more targeted way at the statistics of the text, but, but you get the idea. Okay, so um, that leads then to, so that's the other, the, the third key idea now. And so then this all just leads to uh, uh, the current on, architecture for Nell, which looked a lot like the original architecture, except that we've added some new methods for, for example, extending the ontology and uh, some other classifiers that, for example, actively use the 100,000 search queries that Google has graciously given us per day for Nell to use um, to actively search for text to read and so forth. So let me, um, what I want to do is take a break uh, in about two minutes and then stretch and then come back and finish off. But let me just mention key idea four, which you've probably guessed by now because we've been talking about it all along. Key idea four in Nell is if you want to build a never ending learning system, give it a curriculum. And we've done this manually. When we started with Nell, we only had it work on two learning problems, these two. Classify noun phrases and classify noun phrase pairs into relations. But once it got going on that, then we added in um, additional learning mechanism for discovering those rules for predicting, for inferring new beliefs from old. And I didn't talk about it here, but we also added in another type of learning which Nell is doing to try to figure out which noun phrases refer to which concepts. This is a very fundamental problem. You know, 
Uh, you and I know that, for example, there's a fruit called Apple, and there's a computer called Apple, and there's a company called Apple. But on the web, there, all Nell can see is a noun phrase, Apple. Um, there's not much difference. So um, if the only thing you can observe is text, then all of these concepts that we actually know about are not directly observable to Nell, and it must infer their existence. <clears throat> and so um, Nell has also uh, got a learning component that's trying to learn when is a noun phrase just referring to one thing versus when is it referring to, when is it polysemous, referring to multiple types of concepts. When are two noun phrases synonymous? New York City and Big Apple could be referring to the same concept. Uh, so that's another type of knowledge, uh, extending the ontology. And we're now working on seven and eight. We have some papers and research going on to try to um, add temporal scope to the, some of the beliefs of Nell. One of its failure modes is that, for example, Nell believes Obama is president of the US and it believes Bush is president of the US, and it believes Kennedy is president of the US. It has a lot of evidence for all those things. It doesn't know about time. It's a very debilitating thing to not know about time. So that's, it's time for Nell to know about uh, So yeah, micro-reading simply means detailed analysis, real in-depth understanding of individual sentences. So, Key idea number four is the obvious one that if you want to build a system that's going to learn over years and we hope decades, then you should give it a curriculum, a staged sequence of learning problems where once it's started learning some of the, the ones up there, then it becomes feasible to begin learning some of the ones further down. And exactly how you stage that curriculum, what it means to be a good curriculum, is a really interesting open problem, uh, which we don't understand. But we've just kind of heuristically added these things to Nell as we saw the opportunity to uh, get it to learn some of these things. So let me um, just to reiterate then, here are the key ideas. Right, learning, if you're going to do semi-supervised learning, couple the training of these different functions. For inference, you can learn new coupling constraints and new inference rules once you've read enough. So that Nell can, for example, learn new inference rules by data mining the knowledge that it probabilistically believes. Um, I didn't talk about it, but we, we have a second uh, a replacement for the original horn clause rule learner in Nell that does a better scalable job at learning and doing inference over knowledge bases with hundreds of millions of beliefs. Um, but it's the same idea, same core idea. Uh, for representation, you should try to uh, have some way of growing the ontology as you go. And then you should try to understand how to give a sequence of learning tasks to the system. So if you think about it that way, I think there's, uh, you can see that Nell is kind of a case study that we're using to try to explore and detect what are the key architectural and machine learning kinds of ideas that we'd like to have if we want to have something that, like you and I, learns many things over years in a synergistic way. I would say, to be honest, um, we're happy that we understand some of the principles in a heuristic way. Um, I'm, I'm, I think there's much more to discover than we have so far been able to discover. We don't have anything like a theory of what it means to be a successful architecture for never-ending learning, or a theory that would say provably, if you have an architecture with these properties, it will be able to converge on performance in this way, or that it'll never get plateaued and stuck, or that it'll never 
get worse over time. I wouldn't have any kind of theoretical characterization like that. So I think exploration of this idea is still a very young thing, and there are plenty of opportunities. But hopefully this case study kind of gives us something to start with. So let me, this 1020. Um, it's too long for you guys to sit still for two hours. Um, what if we take a 10 minute break, come back at 1030 and do another 20 minutes? Um, we can do the 20 minutes either as a discussion or uh, I have one interesting theoretical result that I could characterize too. So let's take a break, but we'll start promptly at 1030. <laughs>